Hello, Nantucketers. Happy spring vacation week. Here we are doing our own staycation right here on Nantucket, and it is Thursday, and it is brown bag food for thought Thursday. And everyone in this audience is here because they would like to implement change in their behavior and possibly in their health. I think I see an apple in the audience that looks very healthy. We are in for a treat. I'm glad you joined us. Now is a good time to maybe silence your phones if you haven't done so already. Always nice to do that for our guest speakers. We are in for a treat. Dear friend Kathleen Minahan, fantastic local resource for all things nutrition, and she does a lot of work with the schools. So help me welcome her. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. We can learn what she does and then sit back, relax, and get ready to implement, implement some change. So Kathleen Minahan, talking about good nutrition, eating well, and change. She's a registered dietitian. She received her master's degree in nutrition and health promotion from Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts. After graduate school, Kathleen went on to complete an internship through Hunter College in New York City, and she carried out her rotations, get this, at Cornell University Cooperative Extension, the New York Department of Education's School Food Department, Beth Israel Medical Center, and Kohler Goldwater Specialty Hospital. Not so bad. As a private practice dietitian, Kathleen currently sees clients and works with both individuals and groups, and of course families, and understanding the importance for children to develop a positive relationship with food, Kathleen also works as the farm to school coordinator right here on Nantucket through Sustainable Nantucket. And she teaches students about food from seeds to table. And as if she had all the time in the world, she works with the Nantucket Public Schools to increase the presence of fresh produce in their meals. So I think we are going to have a fun food for thought today. Help me warmly welcome Kathleen Minahan. All right. Well, good afternoon. I'm Kathleen. And um, they asked me to come talk today, and they were talking about how this is the time where New Year's resolutions tend to disappear and people are gearing up for spring and new resolutions come around. And while I often talk about how nutrition relates to disease prevention, I thought it might be time to kind of pare back and talk about how we can make these changes stick um, in our daily lives. Um, but I guess before I get there, I just kind of kind of skipped ahead a little bit, and just talking about my philosophy as a nutritionist and dietitian. Um, I really believe in whole foods, um, a, uh, taking a step back from processed foods, really making manageable, ch manageable changes that are right for you, um, not necessarily pushing the most optimum, I optimal ideas on you, but slowly moving through change one step at a time in a way that's manageable and accessible to your lifestyle, and also starting habits when you're young. Um, you know, if you learn it as a younger, as a youth, you won't need to make these changes later on in life. Um, so the topic of discussion today is how to implement change. And we are, many people focus on, you know, the end outcome, and they don't really pay much mind on how to get there. And so that's really what I'm going to talk about. And I, because of the New Year's resolutions tend to be weight loss and spring is weight loss and I never talk about it in group setting, I, that's what I'm gonna be focusing on. But really, these steps to change can be applied to any health change in your life and I'll try and um, touch upon that a little bit if I forget or skip over things or if nothing's clear as we're moving on, just let me know and I can rewind a little bit. So it's time to evaluate or reevaluate. So whether it's your first attempt at setting a goal or your New Year's resolution didn't work and it's time to refurbish and 
reevaluate, um, you kind of, you need to take a step back and figure out why it didn't work. Um, you want to imagine setting a goal as, as if you were going on a vacation. You don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to Florida, and poof, you're going to be there. You have to make plans. You have to, you know, make accommodations, where you're going to go, what time of year, wh how you're going to get there, where you're going to stay, what you're going to do when you get there, what happens if the weather's bad, which often happens here, what are you going to do, what are ways you're going to get around that challenge. So these are all things to think about when you're starting to make changes in your health and in your diet. So it's time to plan our vacation. Um, so in creating change, in the process of creating change, um, I'm going to be discussing these four topics over the next half hour or so. But it's important to note, change is a process and it's not an event. And number one is behavior change. Um, you're how, I'm 30 years old, you're however old you are. And some of the behaviors you have now could have taken five, 10, 30 years for you to, to, to develop. And it's important to understand that before you head on your journey that because it took you 30 years, tomorrow you're not going to be 10 pounds lighter, you're not going to be running a mile, or your cholesterol isn't going to be 10 points lower. It takes time, and slowly but surely you will get to that end goal. Um, you always want to do your um, homework. You want to know what you're up against. You want to know how to set goals, and you need to be determined to get there. There's going to be roadblocks. There's going to be challenges but you need to understand to work through them. So the first step we are going to talk about, um, behavior change. So some of you may be familiar with stages of change. Number one is pre-contemplation. I didn't put it up there, but that's my job. So you don't even know yet that you, need, you might need to change. It's my job to kind of, or your doctor's job, or your spouse or your daughter or friend to, you know, maybe just give you hints and ideas to maybe get you starting to think about making changes in your, in your behaviors, in your life, and your health. So second up is contemplation. And this is when you have a desire to change. You're not quite sure yet if you're ready to jump into that. You're weighing the pros and cons, flushing out ideas. Um, let's see. So up next we have the preparation. So it's a plan of action. That's planning our vacation. So we know where we want to be. We just need to figure out how to get there. What roadblocks do we have ahead? What steps do we need to take? How is this going to change our lives, both good and bad? Because we only see the good and we don't think about, you know, every change has different, will have different what am I trying to say? Reactions to different, part of, different parts of your life. So up next is the action phase. And this is when you're actually taking charge, you step foot on the boat, you're headed out of here. And um, this is where things are growing great, but it's also where things relapse. So for those of you who had your lofty New Year's goals or your New Year's resolutions, and they're starting to wean down, you have to plan in the action phase what happens when you hit these roadblocks. So this is when, if you hit these relapses, it's not time to give up. It's just time to step back and step back to that preparation phase, figure out what didn't work, and then steam ahead. And then finally is maintenance phase. How are you going to keep this going? Just because you've reached a goal doesn't mean it's over. You, there is still progression past this point, and you might end up ba jumping back up to that preparation phase from time to time. So up next is creating change, um, is doing your homework, actually, sorry. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, oh, no, getting ahead of myself. 
So get the facts. The more, more knowledgeable you are about the goal you're trying to reach, the easier it will be to attain. So you want to know what you're up against, as I said, and prepare for those challenges. So how do you know what those challenges are? You need to know what the right questions are to ask. You're using your pros and cons that you weighed out before, and you're going to the right resources to ask the right questions. So you want to know, what is it going to take to get you to that end point? What's going to change in your life, for, both for the good and for the bad? An example is, you need to make time to go to the gym. You want to you know, decrease your blood pressure. You need to exercise more. You, so therefore, you're going to make time to go to the gym, but that's going to take away from other aspects of your life. How, are you, how do you feel about that? Just really take time to flush out your feelings. Um, how are you going to do this? What are the steps that you're going to take, and are these reasonable steps for you at this moment in your life? You don't have to go 100%. Maybe small, little changes will help get you to that big, larger goal. All right. You want to make sure also when you are asking these questions that you get them from a reliable resource. Um, often, probably 99 times out of 100, when I'm talking to people, they're always saying, my friend accomplished this this way. And I think that you don't need to compare yourself to anyone else. You are your own individual. You have your own life. You have your own schedule. and Something that's easy for one person is not necessarily easy for you, and vice versa. And I don't think you should compare your goals and your progress to get there against other people. That will just set you up for failure. You can maybe get ideas from them, take it from a grain of salt, but don't compare yourself to anyone else. Let's see. So if you are using the internet, just always make sure you use professional um, organizations often there's a lot of opinions out there and you just need to kind of weed through all that information and you can always go to the Center for Disease Control the American Dietetics Association um, the American Academy of Exercise is that what that is? and the American Heart Association and many more you can always go to your doctor um, and it's always important to ask the right professionals the right questions I would never presume to give you um, information on how to increase your exercise. I might mention, you know, it's important to become more active in your life, but I would then refer you to a personal trainer who would help to implement that change. And I would hope vice versa. They would not be giving you diet advice. Um, all right. So as I mentioned, I'm going to kind of just give you some facts on weight loss. Um, because that's kind of how I'm, I don't know, structuring this discussion. So these are the key points I'm going to talk about today. Um, what is significant weight loss? Um, the set point theory, diet versus exercise, calorie restrictions, and fad diets. So significant weight loss. People always come with such lofty goals, and that's wonderful. I don't want to diminish anyone's goals, but the, um, all the studies show that little, exercise, um, little weight loss of 5 to 10 percent can um, cause significant change, lowering blood pressure, lowering blood cholesterol, blood sugar, and greatly reducing your risk for heart disease. So, when you're setting out for weight loss, you want to really understand why it is you're losing that weight. If it's for to lower your cholesterol or blood sugar, you don't need to lose 50 pounds. You know, just a small 10, 5 to 10 percent will give you significant change as long as you can maintain that. And I think that's the key because smaller change is easier to maintain than these larger changes, especially over time. So the set point theory. So the set point is your natural weight range. Just like height, you're genetically predisposed to be within a certain weight range. Um, as 
your met metabolism adjusts for food intake, intake to keep you within this weight range. So if you eat a little bit too much, your body raises in temperature, and your metabolism kicks on to burn those extra calories until you get to a point where your body just can't keep up and you store it as fat. Same goes in the other direction. You eat too little, your metabolism slows down because it thinks it's going into starvation mode and starts storing away some of that fat, increasing your hunger and satiety cues. So you're more hungry, tired, slowing down. So as you gain a significant amount of weight or any weight, you're actually creating, increasing the number of fat cells in your body, which sends signals to your body of what the set point is. So as you increase the number of fat cells, you're also increasing the set point. And once you create these cells, they don't go away when you lose weight, they just grow and shrink. So gaining that, that weight will make it more difficult for you to lose weight thereafter. So it's the, my point in ex telling this to you is prevention of weight gain is almost more important than weight loss. Does anyone have any questions so far? So diet versus exercise. You can't out-exercise a bad diet. People often just sign up for the gym, ready to lose 30 pounds. They go for a half an hour at a time, twice a week. And really, if you think about that, walking a half mile will probably burn as many calories as one and a half um, Oreo cookies. So the ratio is about 30% exercise to 70% diet if you're looking for weight loss. It's the opposite in terms of weight maintenance. So once you get to your goal, or if you are having a cheat day, it's better just to have a few extra snacks and keep exercising than totally give up for the day. So once you reach your goal, goal weight, whatever that is, and you keep exercising, those small little um, cheats in your, in your diet over time will not cause you to fall back. You're also ramping up your metabolism kind of setting yourself on the right track. So, let's see, calorie restriction. So does anyone know how many calories are on one pound? Or guess? Close. Yep. There's 3,500 calories in one pound of weight loss. Most people think that that's one pound of fat. But really, when you lose weight, the ratio is 30% muscle to 70% fat. As you go into, and that's optimal. If you are losing weight slowly, that's gonna, going to be the ratio. That is because muscle is an expensive tissue for your body to hold on to, and it's not an efficient store of energy. Fat, on the other hand, costs almost nothing for the body, and it's a great way to store energy for when you are going into the starvation mode, which is what happens when you deprive yourself of calories, which needs to be done for weight loss. So to keep, so as you restrict those calories more and more, or you try and lose weight faster, that ratio shifts to more fat, uh, more muscle, less fat. So. My point in explaining this is don't rush into weight loss. Don't try and restrict too much because really what you're losing is this muscle, which is increasing your metabolism. And you're in, um, holding on to that fat, which is really what you're wanting to get rid of. So ideally, you want to have a detriment of about 250, which would end up to a, be a half a pound weight loss a week to 500 calories, which would be one pound weight loss per week. And just remember, I know it sounds small, but change doesn't happen overnight. And before you know it, 10, 15 pounds, as long as you're patient. All right, fad diets. So pretty much if it is, has the word diet in it, it tends to be a fad diet. But um, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Losing 10 pounds in five days isn't really realistic and isn't really healthy. 
Um, I'll, t I'll use the low carb diet for example. Um, carbohydrates as a molecule hold water in your body. When you take them away, your body releases that extra water and you're losing mostly water weight and fat, so it's almost a deceiving weight loss. Over time, you tend to, you'll lose more weight, but that instant gratification isn't necessarily you losing weight, you're just losing water weight. Um, if it recommends any single food on a continual basis, it's probably a fad diet. The grapefruit diet, which was popular for a while. Um, let's see. If it suggests a quick and easy weight loss with little no to no effort, weight loss is hard work, takes time, and it takes effort. You, unless you have a health concern, you don't want to eliminate whole food groups. Um, you want to stay away from foods. Um, diets that list foods good versus bad. There's a lot of talk nowadays about superfoods, and yes, they're wonderful, but you cannot live on one, those, any one food alone. You need to have a combination of things. Things work together as a unit in the symbiotic relationship. They help you absorb different nutrients from different, um, different vegetables, and they can work together. So guarantees an outcome in a specific period of time. Remember, everyone's different. Everyone drives at a different speed. Maybe someone's flying to their vacation when someone's driving. Take your time. Don't put yourself up against any judgment. Um, bases its evidence on effective effectiveness from quotes of the participants or the dieters. You want to make sure there's uh, reputable professionals and probably more than one. There are quacks in every profession somehow sneak through and have their grand theme. So just make sure you stand by what they say before you take on that advice. And then if it attempts to sell a product, they're ben you're their greatest customer and they're benefiting from you more than you will be benefiting from them. So next up is setting goals. Does anyone have any questions so far? No? Okay. So SMART, SMART goals is an acronym to help you set up and set forward on change. Um, I should have put and or also rather than or up there, but let's see. So S, you want to be specific. Specific, you want it to be your goals to be specific and significant to you. You want to feel that the change is necessary and will make you feel better in your behavior. You want it to be measurable and meaningful, attainable and action oriented, relevant and rewarding, and timely and tangible. So, specific. When you're setting up your goals, you want to ask who, what, when, where, and why. Who will typically be you? What is generally your blanket statement, so I want to lose weight, but how much? When do you want it to be? You need to be realistic about accomplishing this. Where are you going to accomplish this, and how am I going to? Or why am I going to do this? So I will get in shape. Does anyone have a way that we can improve that statement? Make this a better, more successful goal? Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. So she's saying set steps to getting there, pretty much, right? So I will exercise Monday, Wednesday, Friday at the YMCA to increase my phys physical fitness so I don't feel so tired. So I have a reward for going because I don't want to feel tired all the time. If I'm more energetic, I have a reason to continue to do this. So measurable. 
How will you know if you have succeeded? You don't start off on a race and you maybe don't know if there's an end or a finish line. You need to know when that, where that finish line is so you keep pushing and you don't give up. Let's see. So you want to ask yourself how much, how many, how often, whatever that question would be to give you that measurable um, piece. So, back to the I will get in shape. I will exercise for 30 minutes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, at the YMCA to increase my physical fitness so I don't feel tired. You could also do, I will walk for 30 minutes three times a week and hopefully progress that longer and longer distances within that time. You're getting faster, you're getting stronger. All right, attainable. It's not really a goal if you don't have to work at it. So it should be um, lofty, but it shouldn't be unrealistic. You don't want to set yourself up for failure. You know, saying you're going to go to space probably isn't going to happen, but maybe you can go up in an airplane, ideas like that. Um, you really need to be, hold yourself accountable. No one else is really going to help you do that. Maybe your doctor, maybe I would. But really, in the end, it's up to you because you hold more stake in making this change than I would or your doctor would. Um, let's see. All right, so, for, so for example, if you're already going to the gym for 25 minutes a day, an extra five minutes might not be enough to really create huge change. All right. So be realistic. This is back to kind of my mission. Is it realistic for you? Losing, let's say, exercising five days a week is realistic for me, but for someone who doesn't exercise at all, maybe just starting off for two days a week, 10 minutes at a time, is a better goal to get them up and moving. And then they can readjust, reevaluate, and move on. And do you have everything lined up to make this goal a reality? You need to know your limits, know what's realistic and attainable. And it's not necessarily the same as it is for other people. And then last is the T for timely. Um, when will you complete your goal? Is it a feasible amount of time? What are you going to do now? Oh, okay. When is it a reasonable amount of time? So maybe we're walking for 30, 30 minutes a day and you start off at two miles and you, once you get to two and a half miles, you know, maybe it's time to readjust. Maybe I'm going to be working, walking for 35 minutes in a new goal. Or maybe that you're happy with staying right where you are. Just time to readjust. Have your end, end in mind, but know that your work isn't over. Once you reach your goal, it's supposed hopefully part of your behavior and something that you'll maintain long term. All right. So we have different steps, steps to setting up goals. So we have our long term goals, our midterm goals, and then our operational goals. So operational goals are small little steps that will help us get on our way. So if we wanted to lose 30 pounds, in six months. We have to make small little changes. So I'm going to start measuring out my portions to make sure that I'm not eating more than I'm supposed to. I'm going to set up my measuring spoons in my kitchen next to my refrigerator so I'm always using them. Um, I, or you could do, I want to eat less. How are we going to eat less? I am going to only eat when I'm sitting at my dining room table. I'm not going to eat mindlessly while I'm watching television. Just small little operational goals to help get you to that final change. Set up five to six for every main goal to help you kind of inch away to get you there. And it's important, last and but not least, but just don't give up. You're going to hit roadblocks, reevaluate. Take your step, step back to the preparation phase, but try not to hang out there too long. 
It's easy to kind of get discouraged and go back to preparation and hang out there for six months or until next New Year's. So just keep moving ahead, hold yourself accountable. Don't let your excuses distract you. If you're, you know, just as we're headed out on our vacation, if you hit a roadblock, you're just gonna take a detour and continue on your way. Oh, sorry. So I guess that's all for, uh, yes. That's such a large topic. Um, I was, you know, typically I do talk a lot about nutrition, but the, you know, the idea of this was kind of getting back on track, and I think that this is a huge part of it, um, is actually setting up behavior change as part of nutrition more than actually knowing what to eat. But um, can you ask me just one of those questions that I can answer? Today. Well, I think the thing is, everyone, not everyone agrees on ev everything. So I think that you just need to continually educate yourself and look at d different opinions and weed out the extremes. So you, you seem to know what your opinions are. You know, you don't like processed food. Natural uh, has no meaning. Um, the USDA organic isn't necessarily reliable, thank you. So coming from, coming from a green standpoint, you have to weigh the pros and cons of what's important to you. Is it important to buy locally because you're not shipping from Chile? Is it important to buy only organic because of the carcinogens? That's a really personal question, I think, that takes a lot of weeding through on your own time because my beliefs about food might be a little bit different than yours. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Some foods, yes, some foods, no. Um, some foods, yes, some foods, no. You know, you're definitely when you're cooking, you're denaturing some of the vitamins, you're losing some of that health impact. But in other cases, you're opening up some vitamins and nutrients that you wouldn't have been able to get. So, and that's another one of those diets that there's extreme opinions on and views on when there's... Um, pros and cons to both sides. But I, th I find people are definitely being on a vegetarian diet is a lot more healthful than being on, you know, a meat diet. They're showing studies that reduces cardiovascular disease, lowers blood sugar, reduces weight, um, reduces cholesterol, many other things. But I don't necessarily believe that you have to go to the extreme of being a raw foodist. But if you would choose to do that, you just need to be careful to make sure that you are still getting all the vitamins, minerals, nutrients that you need. Other questions? I think you had your hand up. I just, I just wanted to make one mention. I used to sell a lot of wine, and I sold Spanish wine, in which we uh, started selling Argentinian and uh, Chilean uh, Malbecs and whatnot. Uh, the point I wanted to make was, uh, and I'm, I'm 
I don't, I don't have it researched, but the, in South America, they use a lot more pesticides than uh, we, we allow in America now. Uh, pesticides that we banned years and years ago, uh, Dow Chemical and Union Carbide, has no problem selling to South Americans. If you notice in the produce aisle, the plums look uh, simply fabulous. The Dutch painter should paint uh, still lifes of them. But if you bite into it, it tastes like, I can't say the word on a microphone. <laughs> gotcha, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So, I mean, oh, sorry, I'll wait for Um, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I, I too am concerned about nutrition, and I realize that reading labels and all that is very helpful, but I'm wondering about eating at different times of day. You know, I hear that um, you know, breakfast is important, but you shouldn't be eating eggs, and some say you should, and yeah. carbohydrates and all that sort of thing. How, um, I, I guess it's sort of related to Penny's question, how do you find the information of, of you know, what is really good and what is bad in terms of these general things? Like, is it important to eat breakfast? Should you eat your main meal in the middle of the day? And, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Where do you find that? I find it's, I, can, I can't give you all that information today. I'm definitely available for these, to answer these questions for you. Um, but in terms of answering that question specifically, I think it's important to eat, throughout the day so you're not, this is what I make my suggestions to most of my clients. I like to eat a larger meal in the morning. You need energy to get through the day. You don't want to eat a large meal at night just because you don't need that energy. It's not necessarily going to make you f more fat. You're not going to gain more weight if you eat it at night. Everyone's a little bit different. Some people might need to do that dinner late at night, but I find that it works best if people eat a larger meal at night and smaller meals throughout the day. Uh, sorry, yes, in the morning. And then snacks, smaller lunch, another snack, smaller dinner. But, you know, everyone is different. There is a lot of information that is out there. And I think that that is one of the, you know, nutrition is constantly evolving and constantly changing. And once you have the answer for one thing, it changes the next. And I understand that that's frustrating. But um, I often do, if you keep an eye out in the um, community school flyers, I often do more specific kind of classes on that. But I don't like to kind of give inf nutritional information to a broad audience that might be more specifically, ta need to be more specifically tailored. Right. We all have our own inter individual yes. needs in terms of our diets. Exactly. Um, and our nutritional requir requirements. But um, much like weight loss, learning about what the right food is for us right. as individuals may require some research on our part. And then also relying upon professionals um, like Kathleen to help make decisions ultimately about what we should be using to promote our well-being and our good health. Yeah. And, and the point of my talk today is, is how to use those tools because I find so many times I give people the information and they don't know what to do with it. So they have the information, but they don't know how to implement it into their life. And that was the, my intention today is to kind of help incorporate that into, into your life. And yeah. Now that we go into our third month of the year, yeah. I think a lot of us, I, I can speak for myself at least, I know that I had good intentions on January 1st, but often life intervenes, right? And so it's good to have a reminder about some of those goals and how to attain them. Does anybody have any other questions for Kathleen? And I mean, I, I do have some cards as well. If you have more specific questions, I can give you my card. You can call me or email me. Oh, sorry. I, I'm not insurance covered at the moment. I am moving towards that. Um, I just don't have the a large enough clientele at the moment with all the other things that I'm doing, but um, I, do, I am actually starting to contract my services through the VNA. So um, if you are one of their clients, then you would be covered by insurance. Kathleen, I'm just wondering if you would want to answer a question about what you generally eat 
Do you want to give like a daily sample? I'm just uh, curious. Well, the, my biggest thing is I don't go to the grocery store when everyone else is there because I know everyone's looking in my cart and judging me. <laughs> but um, Trade secrets. Um, but basically, I try and eat whole foods. You know, I try and include whole grains into my diet. You know, that's breakfast. I would have eggs with added vegetables. This time of year, I actually do use frozen vegetables often because I find I don't... I, I live alone, I don't go through fresh produce that often, and it still has a lot of nutritional benefit, to, and it's better than letting all that produce go to waste. Um, so I could have an egg in the morning with some spinach, frozen spinach, um, other things like that. Um, I, let's see, today I had a kind bar and an orange for a snack. Um, I got a panini from, they generously got me a panini from Nantucket Gourmet, so that's not the most healthy thing, but it's okay to add in little things every once in a while, but um, I often eat a salad for lunch, and I add a lot of um, quinoa to it, as well as salsa and cottage cheese and a lot of various other vegetables, tomatoes, cucumbers, and kind of make like a weird salad. And then dinner, I typically will cook something like chicken and rice or pasta and I'm kind of not the best cook in the world, but. <laughs> so a nice healthy balance of foods. Oh, yeah. Any other last questions for Kathleen? Kathleen, with, the, with your chicken, now, do, you buy, do you buy regular chicken uh, with, with the hormones and the whole business, or do you buy, try and buy the high-end, uh, you know, hormone-free? <sighs> I mean, you can get the hormone free. We don't have, I mean, ideally, if we had someone who could slaughter chicken right here, that would be perfect. And I don't eat meat every night. Is that a large concern of yours? Or? I mean, it is. And I was a vegetarian for a long time, actually. And that is a c concern of mine. I often will eat fish. Um, this winter, for some reason, I found myself cooking like Paula Deen. I don't know why, but <laughs> um, lots of the chicken... And um, pork chops, I have been eating more, but I, it is a concern of mine. And it's hard to decipher that information, as you were saying earlier, um, because that information is not available even at the store. The word natural on a product means nothing. You can put natural on TNT or arsenic. And that's, you know, it's hard to decipher. And... Having a third party um, organic certified label on top of the USDA is the best thing to look for. Um, as many certifications as possible, make sure they're reputable. How do they check farmer to farmer? Um, there's just different things to kind of filter through. Yes, in some ways it's about determining what your priorities are and then yeah, exactly. doing the research to find I, out. If nutrition were easy, I would be out of a job, so I don't know. <laughs> this is true. Well, thank you all for joining us today, and thank you, Kathleen. Thank you.